Well, good morning. We're here to start service here at Midlothian Baptist Church. We want to welcome all visitors. We hope you leave better than when you came. How many are ready for spring? I'll tell you what, I'm ready for the warm weather. I'll tell you. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing. And uh, looking forward to, we've got Brandon preaching today. And we're going to hear about the youth trip uh, with the uh, inner tubing and stuff in uh, Mass and Nutton, wasn't it? All right. Amen. Let's all stand. We're going to sing another one whom I have believed. Yeah. 
gentlemen, you may be seated. Uh, we look like we have a lot of folks trying to get here from the sleep. Uh, no, not lack of sleep, but we're glad that you're here today. Uh, have you uh, been preparing your heart for worship this morning? Or has it been a mad rush just trying to get here? All right. I know sometimes it is that way, but we need to have a heart that is in tune with God to, today as we receive his word and to be with his fellow, uh, his children as we worship him today. Thank you for being here. If you're our guest, and so far I don't see any guests, but if, you, if I miss you and you are, there's a green information packet in front of you. Uh, grab that and fill that card out as the offering plate comes by, and we would uh, like to get to know you, and I'd like to meet you afterwards. I have a gift for you out in the foyer. Uh, those who are online, we welcome you today. Thank you for tuning in, and I pray that the service will be a blessing to you. All right, hey, all those uh, fellows that cooked raised both Pauls in the atmosphere. Man, it was a great breakfast, and uh, I tell you what, if you uh, there's plenty left. I mean, they made a lot, and we're down in attendance today. So if you want to, after this service is over, if you want to go over and to partake of that delicious breakfast, you're certainly welcome to do that. And you won't have to take your wife out to lunch today. You can just uh, you do that over there. It is great, man. I really enjoyed it. They were here, what, 5 o'clock? I don't know, 5, 6 o'clock this morning preparing that. So we do appreciate that uh, service to our church family. A couple quick things. Uh, announced a few weeks ago that our, on our anniversary service, we're going to have a little flyover of the building project that we are proposing. Uh, we didn't get that because... Um, We've changed uh, the building. It was going to be detached, but Buddy found out if we attach it to this building, then it will really save us money uh, in the septic system. So uh, it's going to be right out, Lord willing, it will be right off of the drive under. That drive under will become a, a glassed in breezeway, and it will run that direction parallel with Lux Lane. And it's a multi purpose building, and we'll use it for. For like the breakfast this morning and other activities so um, so uh, we, we had to change it so that's put that fly over and the presentation a little bit late so um, so we'll be praying about this project are you praying about it all right are you praying about it if we don't pray about it you know why have a building you know if we don't pray about the use of it and if people aren't willing to serve you know let's don't build it if we don't have folks willing to take up leadership positions uh, so we have to have both. So be praying about it, and and let's see what God will do. We want it, you know, liberals can build buildings, but we want a building project to be a demonstration of God's power. So be in prayer over that, if you would. Um, second thing, I have good news. Our, our missionary, the Williamsons, will be here March the 30th. They're leaving June the 3rd. They were at a missions conference in Texas, and there was another missionary there that has 10 kids. He and his wife have 10 kids. They're third-generation missionaries to Japan. And uh, they're, they're getting ready to go back to Japan. And uh, Glenn announced that, you know, they needed tickets for uh, their trip to Ukraine. This missionary family with 10 kids bought their tickets. And they said, we already have our tickets, we already have our money raised, and we want to do this for you. So those missionaries bought their tickets for Glenn and Eve to go. So they have their seat assignments, the Lord willing, leave June the 3rd. They're going to be here June the 3rd, March the 30th. They're going to try to sell the RV, so let's pray that that will happen. And then another missionary service that we support, the Good Samaritan Inn, it's a rescue mission downtown. They have some apartments, and they're going to let Glenn and Eve live there rent-free for two months uh, while they try to sell their RV. So that's an answer to prayer. So uh, thank God for that. Um, so be praying for them that they will be able to get that last 10% of their support that they need in these next, uh, next few missions conferences that they're, they're having. One last thing, uh, and when we take the offering in a moment, you're going to see a video where we are going to start a new curriculum for our children. It's called the Gospel Project. It's three years. They go through the, the Bible. There's a little promotional video that you'll see on that. And uh, this coming Saturday, we want to have all those who are teaching our children we're going to feed you a good breakfast. Hey, we could just keep what's left over. <laughs> no, we'll have a good breakfast for you at 8.30. And uh, we want to go over this curriculum with you. And uh, so I hope that you'll come out. Brandon's going to do a, a demonstration of the lessons. And I'm really excited about this material. And so if you are a current 
children's teacher, or if you're uh, interested in learning, maybe not ready to commit, but you'd like to learn what is involved in teaching our children, then you come out Saturday, and uh, be not over two hours, <clears throat> and we will uh, get you up to speed on this. So I'm really excited about what God's going to do there. All right, ushers, if you will come, we will uh, uh, take the offering. While they're coming, uh, at the end of the service, you're going to meet Tim Hood, and he's going to tell you about uh, a way that we're going to uh, raise a little money for, or potentially raise money for our missions trip. We have the mission team in place. There's 10 folks that's going to go, so we can't take anyone else, but um, we're going to be going to Panama, so he'll tell you more about that at the end of the service. All right? Brother David, would you come up here, please, and lead us in prayer for today's offering? And then as soon as this is over, she'll start the video. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for all you've done. You've given us so many blessings. We're so grateful for all you do, all you continue to do. Lord, as this ministry prepares for that which you've placed upon the hearts of our pastor and the church body, the new building, the, the expansion, uh, the growth in the different programs, the outreaches of the light of the world that uh, as this world appears to be darker and darker, Lord, that you would provide a light that would shine brightly through this ministry. We pray for this offering. We pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs not only that are right before us, but those that will come ahead of us as, as we plan and as we uh, uh, attempt to fulfill the vision you have put on the hearts of the leadership of this church. We just ask, Lord, that your spirit would reign freely through this service in a great and mighty way and that you would be glorified. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Generation after generation, we have gathered for one reason, to tell the story, the one that changes everything, that salvation is not found within, but with Jesus. We tell it again and again, generation upon generation. We teach them the Bible isn't just 66 books bound together. It's one big story. When we see the Bible as one narrative, it changes how we read it. We see that Adam's fruit led to Noah's reign and Joseph's pit. We see that Abraham's ram and Jonah's fish and David's giant foretold us of Mary's manger and the one who would reunite man with God. When we see that every story points to the one, it changes how we teach our kids, how we see ourselves, how we see God. We have one mission, one purpose, one job to do. To share the story with them in as many ways and as many times as we can. This is the big story of the Bible. This is the one story that changes everything. This is the Gospel Project for Kids. Well, good morning. Won't you stand with us here as we continue to worship the Lord through song?
Thank you. You may be seated. Children, you may be dismissed to Children's Church. Ryan, would you come, please? Uh, we have with us a guest. This is Ryan Cottle. He works for the Florence Baptist Temple. Uh, that's our mother church. Probably about 1,700 people gathered there today. Is that right? 1,500 people. And he teaches their young adult class of 50, 60, 70 young people, young adults, like, like Eric does here. But um, his family's here, and so we're glad to have them. This is Kathy's uh, niece. She was the mean niece. And, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we're delighted to have them here. I want him to pray, give uh, Brandon a moment to catch his breath. He's preaching today. Uh, I think Time Train Sunday is a great way to let him preach so I can realize. I told a pastor, friend, our youth pastor is preaching. He said, that's a great idea. Let's market that. <laughs> All right. So uh, we'll let Brandon catch his breath. And Ryan, we're delighted to have you here. Thank you for being uh, at your church. We're so supportive, you know, back in the, when we started there two years ago. So come lead us in prayer. All right. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father and God, we come to you through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we're uh, thankful for the joy that there is in gathering together as as uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, we pray for our nation this morning. There's such discord and division, and that we do pray. We believe there's hope for our nation in, in you, and so we pray for a spiritual revival. We pray for our leaders, that they would look to you and look to your word, and that you would um, draw them to yourself and they'd make wise decisions. I pray for this church, Lord, I pray your blessing on it, and Pastor Ken and the uh, the other staff and, and lay people that serve here so faithfully, I pray that you bless them and guide them and that um, you'd have your hand on this church and people would be saved and grow in Christ. And Lord, I pray now for this opportunity that we all have, this privilege that we have to hear the word of God preached. I pray for our speaker, that you'd fill him with the Holy Spirit, um, that the word of God would be clear to us and that we would have receptive hearts. I pray we would not be just hearers of the word, but that we would be doers, and um, that everything we do today would honor and glorify you and uh, lift up your son, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Good morning. God is good. Amen? Amen. Well, I'll tell you what, Pastor, I will preach anytime you ask me to preach. It's probably teaching the word is one of my favorite things to do besides spending time with my wife, driving my truck, and watching baseball. So it's a good day anytime I get to, to preach the word and, and share the word of the Lord with God's people. Now today, you know, Pastor, the last several months has been preaching from the book of Romans, but today we're going to go back into the Old Testament, and we're going to look at a, at a story in the Old Testament. It's perhaps one of the saddest stories I've ever read in the Old Testament, but we'll get to that in a minute. But if you've got your Bibles with you this morning, go ahead and turn to the book of Second Chronicles chapter 24. We'll be there in, in just a moment, but before I get into that, a lot of you know that back in January, on a, on a snowy and icy Sunday, I had a little car accident with my, my old truck. And unfortunately, I totaled my old truck on the bridge over the river on 288. And so for the second time in two years, Larkin and I had to go vehicle shopping. And as we were talking about what vehicle to get, of course, I said, well, I'm going to get another truck. I love having trucks. I love being able to drive it. I love sitting up high. I love being able to see the whole road and tow things and put things in the bed. In my mind, there's something right in the heart of a man when he's driving a truck. So we went out and we started looking for another truck. And as we're out there looking, we find at this one dealership a beautiful 2007 Ford F-150. I mean, this thing was gorgeous. Had low miles, right in our price range. I mean, and it had all the bells and whistles that were top of the line 12 years ago. Not something that I'd be able to afford then, but hey, maybe I can afford it now. So we take it out for a test drive, and it, it drives great, and, and we think this is going to be the car for us. So we take it back to the dealer and say, okay, we're interested in this truck, but we need to come back tomorrow with my wife's dad. He knows vehicles better than I do, so we're going to come back tomorrow, and if you could put it up on the lift, that would be great. So we come back the next day with, with Larkin's dad. You know, he and I do a lot of the maintenance on Larkin's and my cars together. And uh, we put it up on the lift there at the dealership. And y'all, I have not seen so much rust on the undercarriage of a truck in my life. 
I mean, I don't know how I would have gotten the tire down if I would have needed to change the tire, but that wasn't even the kicker. Now, this picture isn't exactly what we saw, but it's a good representation of what we saw. I didn't take a picture of it, but as we looked at it, and I'm looking through, I find a hole rusted in the frame about the size of a quarter. So, of course, we walk away from this truck. It broke my heart to do that, but we walked away from this truck. But as I think about this truck, you know, I wonder if this is like some people's spiritual lives. You know, you look great on the outside, like this wonderful, beautiful truck, but upon further examination, if the inside were to match the outside, it looked more like this. You know, something that's really, really rusted out, something you don't even want to drive. And as I think on this as well, you know, I'm reminded of a friend in college who had this very issue. Uh, he, was, he lived on my dorm my freshman year, and he was the starting quarterback for our, for our football team all four years. I mean, he's a great guy, great football player, probably was the best quarterback our school had had to that point. We've had better quarterbacks since him, but that's besides the point. Uh, but he was probably the greatest one that we had had to that point. And to top it all off, he seemed like he had a great walk with God. He was a leader on the hall. I mean, he was, besides the fact that he was a great athlete, he was the person that everyone on the hall wanted to be like. He had this strong relationship with God. Now, fast forward a few years to after graduation, and he's moved to Florida with his wife, and he becomes a high school football coach there in Florida and a teacher. And he's moved away now from the influence of Liberty University, our Christian school, and the influence of some of the godly professors and men and women that were there. And all of a sudden, the rust starts to show to the point where I found out about a year or so ago that he was arrested and put in prison for taking indecent liberties with a couple of students. How does something like that happen, though? I mean, how does someone go from being the starting quarterback for perhaps the world's greatest Christian university, most well-known Christian university, to to being a, a prison inmate? How does he go from being one person with one group of people to someone completely different elsewhere? And the biggest question I have, how does someone who claims to know Christ and seems to exhibit some of the fruit of the Spirit completely change and act like he has no faith in God at all. But the scary thing is, as I look at this, you know, I know for myself, I could go, man, to some extent, that could be me. But for the grace of God, there go I. Yet how is it that sometimes we'll come to church and we'll look like this F-150? We'll look great on the outside. And we've got great appearances. But upon closer examination, we should actually look like this. Now, some of us may never kill or or, or do something that that warrants us going to jail, but we'll act one way when we enter church and when we leave and get away from the influence of our, our church family, we act completely different. You know, we're all guilty of acting one way around one crowd and then modifying who we are around another. You know, and I might tell myself, well, you know what, the real me is the, the one who does all the good things. You know, the real me is the one who is who I am in church. But that doesn't change the things or do, that I do or say outside of church. And so then I ask myself, how real is my faith? Am I really following Jesus or am I pretending to follow him because that's what people expect me to do? Which me is the real me, and am I a fake follower? And that's the question I want you to ask yourself today. Am I a fake follower? We're going to look today at the story of a fake follower in Second Chronicles chapter 24. And this story is one of the saddest stories I've ever seen. It's about a king named Joash. And as we go throughout this story today, there are three statements that I'm going to make about Joash, and we're going to evaluate those statements one by one here in just a minute. But just so you can, you know, kind of keep track and know where I am in the scheme of things, those three statements are, Joash just wanted to fit in with the crowd. Statement two, Joash's faith in God was not his own. And statement three, Joash did not finish well. And then ultimately, because of those three statements, I can say that Joash is a fake follower of God. Now, before I get too deep into those statements, I I do want to give us a little bit of background on on this story and the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles. Now, when you look at the books of 1 and 2 Chronicles, they're what I like to call God's hug 
after the spanking. And the reason I like to call it that is, and some of you have heard me say this before, for 70 years, Israel and Judah had been exiled out of the promised land. See, they had done wrong in the eyes of God for so many years that he had to punish them. He warned them of this. So he takes them out of the land, but now as First and Second Chronicles are being written, they've come back into the land, and essentially what God is doing through these books is he's taking the people of Israel and Judah on his knee and he's saying, I love you. You're still my chosen people. You're still the ones that I've chosen to save the world through. But do you understand why I had to do what I did? Any good parent would do that. When you punish your child, you take him on your knee. You said, do you understand why I had to punish you? I still love you, but I had to punish you for this reason. And that's what God is doing in First and Second Chronicles. The other thing to note about First and Second Chronicles is that they give the exact same history as the books of First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. But the difference is that the books of Samuels and Kings they are written right after the events that they describe, and First and Second Chronicles are written years later. It's, it's kind of like the difference between watching the news and the History Channel. You, you watch the news, and it tells you what happened. And in fact, a lot of times it's telling you while it's happening. But when you watch the History Channel, if they're doing the documentaries the way they designed them to be originally, then they're telling you the story of what happened later, but not only are they telling you about what happened, they're telling you a little bit of why it happened, how it happened, and sometimes how it could have been prevented. And that's kind of how we're going to look at this story of Joash today. We're going to look at not only what happened, but why it happened. So let's, let's begin and let's look at the first statement that I made. Joash wanted to fit in with the crowd. Now as we begin to look at his story, I like to call Joash a social and spiritual chameleon. Have you, have you ever seen a chameleon before or read about them? They're these really cool animals that God designed to change the color of their skin based on their surroundings. It's really cool. You can put them one place and they're one color and another place they're a different color and they can change it like that. It's really cool. But they do it to blend in, to protect themselves, to fit in with their surroundings. And so a spiritual and social chameleon will do something similar. They'll change their behavior and, and their beliefs sometimes based off of who he or she is around. And this is what Joash did. We're not, not going to look at every verse in chapter 24, but let's look at a few here. Let's look at, at verses 1 and 2 very quickly. I've got them on the screen if you don't have your Bible with you. It says, Joash was seven years old when he became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zibiah of Beersheba. Joash did what was right in the sight of the Lord all the days of Jehoiada the priest. Now as we look at this, we see that Joash becomes king when he's seven years old. Can, can you imagine that? Being a king at seven. You know, here in the United States, you've got to be at least 35 years old to run for president. So I'm sorry, Pastor, you've got to wait a few years before you can make your run. But our founding fathers, they, they made this rule because they believed that someone should have some wisdom and some maturity before they lead a country. But that's not how it works in a monarchy. In a monarchy, if you're on deck, the next one in line, and the person before you dies, guess what? You're up. No matter how old or young you are, you're it. And that's what happened to Joash. Joash became king because all the other heirs before him were dead. Well, that's also a really sad story and interesting as well. I'll, I'll summarize it for you. Essentially, what happens is that Joash, when his father dies, his grandmother, Athaliah, who also, by the way, is the daughter of Queen Jezebel in the northern kingdom, she goes ahead and kills all of the other heirs to the throne in Judah, except for Joash. Well, why doesn't she kill Joash? Because Joash has another relative, Jehoiada, who I believe is his uncle, and Jehoiada comes and rescues Joash, and he takes him to the one place that Athaliah isn't going to look. He hides him in the temple of the Lord, and there he raises him for, for seven years, and, and then when he turns seven, he crowns him king, makes a covenant with all of Israel, and at that time then, as they're crowning him king, Everyone comes in, and including Athaliah, she comes in to see what's going on, and she runs out, and the people of Judah kill her. 
because she had been such an evil and wicked king. And so Joash now has become king because his relatives who had ruled before him were pretty much evil, and they're all dead. Almost all of his family is dead except for Jehoiada, who saves him. And Jehoiada, by the way, is the high priest. The high priest, and because he walks with God, he raises Joash to walk with God as well. And as long as Jehoiada is alive, Joash is following the Lord and doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. Let me say that again and pay very attention to the first few words I say. As long as Jehoiada is alive, Joash is following the Lord and doing what is right in the eyes of the Lord. He repairs the temple. He restores the the sacrificial system that's there. He even goes ahead and restores the treasury and all of the, the items that were in the temple that were plundered by his grandmother. He restores them. And so this all seems like things that someone who is following hard after the Lord would do, right? But let's look at what happens after Jehoiada dies. Let's jump ahead to verses 15 through 19 here. It says, But Jehoiada grew old and was full of days, and he died. He was 130 years old when he died. And they buried him in the city of David among the kings, because he had done good in Israel, both toward God and his house. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, the leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king. And the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God of their fathers and served wooden images and idols. And wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord. And they testified against them, but they would not listen. So his whole life, jo- jo- Jehoiada, who was his father figure, he had followed Jehoiada, who's his father figure. He's his mentor. Jehoiada served God, so Joash serves God. But Joash never really followed God himself. And once Jehoiada is no longer there to follow and influence him, Joash starts following others. And they lead him right to following false gods. See, once Jehoiada is dead and no longer his main influence, Joash changes his stance. He changes his beliefs and changes his behavior based off of what he thinks is acceptable by those that are influencing him. Joash is a social and spiritual chameleon that is swayed by whoever has the greatest influence over him. And I like this quote as I studied for this. I like this quote by David Guzik. It says, Joash seems to have been a fundamentally weak man. He did good when he was under the influence of the godly Jehoiada, but he did bad when he was under the influence of these leaders of Judah who led him right into idolatry. I like that he says he's a weak man. He's got no backbone. He doesn't have or think for himself because he's always trying to please other people. But how many of us do that too? I mean, we're in a church, and when we're in church, we're one way, but outside of church and and around other people, we act completely different just to fit in. Remember, fake followers only want to fit in. And I know I've done that. You know, I did that a lot when I was early on in my faith, you know, middle school and high school. Man, I'd come to church, and when I'm around my parents, I act one way because I'm the pastor's son, and that's what they expect me to do. And then when I go to school, and I'm around my school friends, well, I act the way they think I should act. And then when I get with my cross-country and track friends, I act like how they think a jock should act. And then when I get with the theater nerds, I act like a theater nerd should act because that's how they're telling me to do. And I'm doing so on and so forth every time I get with a new group of people, and I'm putting on so many masks that I don't even know who I am anymore. And when I finally stop messing around, I realized there was only one person I needed to be and one person I needed to worry about pleasing. I needed to be the man that God created me to be and I needed to worry about pleasing him. I needed to be consistent with who I was and who God created me to be. But y'all, that's hard to do sometimes. You know, I want to please those that are around me and I don't want to stir the pot the wrong way. So sometimes we'll adapt and, and change who we think others want us to be. But when we do that, we paint a really poor picture of who Jesus is and what it means to be his follower. One of the greatest quotes I've ever heard, I don't remember who said it, but it goes something like this. The greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians 
who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, but at the end of Sunday service, they walk out the door and get on about their lifestyle. That is what a, an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So as we proceed through the rest of our study this morning, I want you to ask yourself, if you didn't know Jesus right now, if you were not a follower of him, would your life outside this building look exactly the same as it does? Are you a social and a spiritual chameleon just like Joash, someone who changes their behavior and beliefs based off of the people you're with and, and whoever's influencing you? Because again, I want you to remember one more time, fake followers only want to fit in. Now the second thing that I want you to see about fake followers through Joash's story is that fake followers have not made their faith their own. Joash did not have his own true faith in God. And we can look back at the, the verses that we've just read and we can see that Joash hasn't made his faith his own. His faith wasn't personal because his faith was based on the convictions of Jehoiada rather than his own convictions. You know, he follows Jehoiada and he went through the motions of being religious, you know, restoring the temple and all the good things that he did. And while that is great, he never had his own personal relationship with God. He just wanted to make Jehoiada happy. So he did what he thought Jehoiada would want him to do. He went through the motions and appeared to do the things that please God. But again, look at, at the words written in verse 15. And there's just three of them I want to highlight. But Jehoiada, skip a few words, died. But Jehoiada died. And this was the turning point and undoing of Joash because his faith wasn't his own. He hadn't taken ownership of his own faith. When Jehoiada was taken away from Joash, he's shown that he has no faith at all. Remember, as long as Jehoiada is alive, Joash does what's right in the eyes of God. But he's not there anymore. And once he's not there, Joash starts following other people. And they lead him right to following false gods. Now, in Joash's defense, he probably took these false idols as seriously as he took his faith in God, which was not too seriously at all. See, Joash is basing his faith off of the one who is leading him in that moment, the one who is influencing him in that moment, and not the one true God. But we do that too, don't we, sometimes? You know, we'll base our faith, faith over the one who has the greatest influence over us. I know I've done that. It's easy to do things like get up and sing in the choir or teach a Sunday school class. All things that on the surface look really good, but if you get down to it, you realize that like Joash, there's no real desire for God. Joash was doing all these wonderful things, but you look deep in his heart, and there's so much rust there that he has no desire for God. I remember what, what Jesus tells us in, in Matthew chapter 7, that there are going to be those who cry out to him and say, Lord, Lord, and, he's, and they'll say, we did this and this and this in your name. And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. These are fake followers. You know, we, we look at these influences and we look at this and we, you know, think about why you're here. You know, sometimes that influence is your parents. You came to church when you were younger because your mom and dad told you that's what you're supposed to do. That's what I did. It was all about coming to church to please mom and dad, to do what mom and dad wanted me to do. I did what it was because it was expected of me. I'm the pastor's son growing up. I've got to go to church. I've got to read my Bible. I've got to do these things. And it's really easy, especially for teenagers, when they move out of mom and dad's house and go to college to fall away because that influence isn't there anymore. You know why that influence isn't there anymore and why they've stopped going? Because it was their parents' faith and not their own. Again, that was me in high school. And that was me up until about the age of, of 12 or 13 years old. And finally I realized it's not about mom and dad and what they do. It's about me and my relationship with God. But Joash never came to that realization. It was all about pleasing the one who influenced him. Or maybe, here's another angle to look at it. You know, sometimes we base our faith off of a celebrity preacher or, or Christian leader. But then when that person has a moral failure and actually acts like a human being and they fall away, then our faith in God is rocked because our faith was actually misplaced and was put in that person instead of having true faith in God. 
You know, it was all based off of their faith and their convictions. And when they show to have fallen away for some reason, that it's, it, oh my goodness, I'm, I've got to question this. You know, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with, with showing respect for those who have taught the word well. But what is wrong is to completely base our faith off of who they are rather than who God is. Now, and I've seen it happen a lot. You know, I've seen it where someone, this has happened to me in the past, where someone comes up to me and says, hey, Brandon, you know, did you hear about such and such a preacher? You know, and they'll mention a celebrity preacher's name and they'll say, you know, he gave in to the temptation of pornography and he's had an affair and now he's fallen away and now I don't even know if my salvation is valid. What? See, they're placing their faith in him. But, you know, I could have done that. The night I got saved, we went to the creation festival, and I had heard the gospel before, but I finally got it that night. And the man that preached it, preached it so well, but I found out a few years later after giving my life to Christ that this man did exactly that. He, he fell into the temptation of pornography, had an affair, and then stepped down from his ministry to the point where he's no longer preaching anymore. He's just an inspirational speaker. But I didn't question my salvation at that point because my faith was placed in Jesus and not in Pat Masidi, the man who preached the sermon the night I got saved. My faith in God is just that. It's mine. It's personal. It's not my parents. It's not my wife. It's not pastors or anyone else who has an influence over me. It's my faith in God. It's my relationship with God. But if your faith has not been truly made your own, if it's been based off of pleasing someone else or, or based off of the other person's faith, then it's really easy to fall away when that person is gone or falls away themselves. Fake followers, again, have not made their faith personal. It's not been their own. I really like this quote by G. Campbell Morgan about Joash, and, but it applies to us. However valuable the influence of a good man may be, it remains true that if a man has nothing more to lean on than that, if it should fall, if it should fail, collapse is almost inevitable. All foundations fail, save one. And that one foundation is a true faith that's personal and it's a relationship with the one and true God. Finally, as we get ready to kind of round things out here, I want you to see that a fake follower is not going to finish well. Joash doesn't finish well. As we look at his story, we see that although he seems to start well, he doesn't finish well. Joash started off looking like he's trying to please God, and while he's doing the right things to begin with, as his life winds down, we see and learn that he does the exact opposite. And there are even those in his life that were trying to bring Joash back to God. In fact, Jehoiada's son, Zechariah, who perhaps Joash grew up with, comes to him and tells him what he's doing is wrong. But instead of listening to him, Joash gets the people that he is influenced by to kill him. Look at, look at 2 Chronicles 24, verses 20 through 22. It says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada the priest, who stood above the people and said to them, Thus says God, why do you transgress the commandments of the Lord so that you cannot prosper? Because you have forsaken the Lord, he also has forsaken you. So they conspired against him, and at the command of the king, they stoned him with stones in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king did not remember the kindness of Jehoiada his father that had been done to him, but killed his son, and as he died, he said, the Lord look on it and repay. You know, this was someone who, like I said, was probably like a brother to Joash. Zechariah is Jehoiada's son, and Joash not only allows those he's following to kill him, he orders it. It says, at the command of the king, they stoned him. So Joash at this point has fallen so far from God that he is willing to commit murder. And as you can imagine, things do not go well for Joash after this. His nation begins to collapse and there were, there's no one in his life that he can trust. And he's got no relationship with the God that he pretended to follow early on in his life. And as we look here at the end of Joash's story, 
in verses, in verses 24 and 25, it says, The army of the Syrians came with a small company of men, with a, but the Lord delivered a very great army into their hand because they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. So they executed judgment against Joash. And when they had withdrawn from him, for they left him severely wounded, his own servants conspired against him because of the blood of the sons of Jehoiada the priest and killed him on his bed. And so he died. And they buried him in the city of David, but they did not bury him in the tombs of the kings. See, Joash's story starts out so promising. And for most of his life, it looks like he's following hard after God. But remember, he's a fake follower. He cared more about what other people are expecting him to do and act than he did about actually knowing God for himself. And in the end, the people that he cared about impressing the most didn't even treat him like a king. They kill him, and then rather than bury him in the tombs of the kings, they just throw him in a random hole in the city of David. And the Bible is, is littered with stories about people who started off strong but don't finish well. And each story is sad, but I find this one especially sad because Joash is a king of Judah, and we're told back at the very beginning, towards the beginning, before they even have kings, that as the king of your land goes, so will your country. Joash had the ability to guide this country to be a good place. He had a chance to be different than the majority of those that came before him because as we read about the kings of Judah and Israel throughout their history, we see that this one was evil and this one was evil and this one was evil and there's only a couple that at the very beginning they can say, they did right in the eyes of God. And Joash was one of them at the beginning. But at the end of his life, he ends up being like the majority of the kings before him, doing what is evil in the eyes of God. And as I think on this idea of finishing well, I'm reminded of when Paul wrote to Timothy saying, I've, I've fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. So Paul is saying here, I have finished well. I'm going to finish well. And I love how Paul compares the Christian life to running a race, especially because I used to run track and cross country. That's language I can understand. You know, because I think back to when I was running in high school and my coaches, yeah, they were focused with how we started. They liked us to start well, but they really wanted us to finish well because that's where it mattered. And I think about one race in particular, probably my junior or senior year, I had had a particularly bad day in school that day. Like, this was really bad. I don't remember what was so bad about it anymore, but by the time I got to the race that afternoon, I was mad. I mean, I, there was, I was so mad I, I could have spat. You know, I was really, really mad. And so I get up to the starting line, and as soon as the gun goes off, I go out like a shot. And I'm running well for the first mile. In fact, after the first mile of a three-mile race, I'm leading this race. I've never led a race over three miles after a mile before. That wasn't my style. That's not how I ran a race. I held back. I paced myself a little bit so that I could pick people off one by one at the end, not run out in front of them at the beginning. In short, it looks like I started well. In fact, I could, could think about the people standing by going, man, Brandon's running better than he's ever run before. But I didn't finish well. Because by the time I got to the end of that race, instead of me picking people off like I liked, it was people picking me off. And by the time the race finished, I think I finished in like fifth or sixth place. It was awful. I felt so bad. And coach comes up to me, puts his arm around me and says, Brandon, you started well, but you didn't finish well. But if I think about it, did I really start well? Because I put on a good show. I fooled my coach. I fooled the people that followed us. But in the end, I didn't finish well. And God, like an, a coach with his athletes, wants us to finish well. We can't be like me in my race and not finish well. We've got to finish strong. But I didn't actually start that race early because I didn't do anything to set myself up to finish well. My priorities for running the race were not right. And I had a really bad attitude coming into that race. And you do not get a good start in life like Joash if you're living just to fit your social environment and fit into that and have not made your faith your own. You're not going to finish well because you've not set yourself up to start well either in the beginning of your race or in the middle at some point. 
And there are too many times where I think we are like Joash and we do things that can prevent us from finishing well. For me, it was I started off too fast. I could, have, I could have finished better if I hadn't started off so fast in that race. And I think finishing well is on Paul's mind when he writes to the people in Galatia, to their church, where he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He's saying, you started off good, but what's going on here, people? Something's preventing you from doing well, from finishing well. And as humans, you know, we're just that, we're human. And it seems that there are things that we will allow to get in our way that prevent us from finishing well. And for Joash, it was that he wanted to, to please the people that were around him and that he, he didn't have his own faith with God. He was influenced away from what his father figure, Jehoiada, had taught him. So as we look at Joash's story here, we first see that he is a social and a spiritual chameleon. He follows God as long as Jehoiada, a godly influence, was alive. But as soon as that influence is gone, he followed the whims of those who influenced him towards disobedience and rebellion. Remember, fake followers only want to fit in. We also saw that as a result of Joash basing his faith in God off of Jehoiada's faith, that his faith was not his own. When the figure he based his faith off of was gone, he was shown to have no personal faith in God at all. So not only do fake followers want to fit in, but they also have not made their faith their own. And then finally, Joash's lack of faith caused him to finish his life poorly, leaving behind everything that he knew was right, even to the point of committing murder. Now, Joash probably didn't start off life thinking, oh, you know what? When I grow up someday, I'm going to be a murderer. Oh, it doesn't work like that. But here he was because of the choices and decisions he made about his faith in God. He was allowed, he allowed himself to be pulled away from what was right. Joash was a fake follower of God. And Joash's story is a really sad story. But it should serve as a warning to us and it should cause us to evaluate ourselves today. And I want you to ask yourself, am I a fake follower? Am I a social and spiritual chameleon that, that gives in to the whims of those that are around me just trying to fit in? Is my faith just that, my faith, my own? And am I setting myself up to finish this race of life well? Only you can answer those questions. And the answers to the first two are going to help you determine how well you are going to finish your race. I know you probably want to finish well. I know I do. None of us in here wants to finish our lives in a disgrace and be thought of ill by our friends and family or the community that surrounds us, which is what happened to Joash. And such an outcome can be reversed when we choose to be, choose not to be a fake follower and we choose to be a true follower of Jesus. So I want you to ask yourself again, ultimately, how real is my faith? Am I a fake follower? Is my faith based on really following hard after Jesus or is it about acting the way that someone expects you to act? There's nothing wrong with wanting to emulate someone else or even following their example, but your faith cannot be about them. Your faith needs to be about a real relationship with God for yourself. What would happen today if you decided to stop being a different person to different groups of people? What would happen if you decided to pursue a relationship with God above all else and not care if your relationship with God looked like this person's relationship with God? I can tell you what would happen. If you decided to truly focus on following Jesus with everything you have, then you'd be setting yourself up to finish well, unlike King Joash. And as we close today, the band's going to play a song here in a moment, and we're going to open up the altar. And there's two groups that I'm addressing here today specifically. Maybe you're in the first group. Maybe you have been a fake follower. Maybe you've been coming just to please your parents or to please someone in your life. 
Maybe you're coming because your faith has been placed in, in Pastor Ken or, or in some other celebrity preacher that's out there, and you haven't made your faith your own yet. If you want to do that today and get that right, the altar is open for you to come up. Talk to Pastor. Talk to one of these deacons. Talk to, pull someone aside and talk to them and say, hey, look, I need to make my faith my own. What can I do to do that? And we'll be happy to share that with you. Or maybe you're in the second group that I'm addressing today. Maybe you haven't even begun that relationship with God yet. Well, we want to give you that opportunity to begin that relationship with God. All it takes, all it takes to be saved is to believe in your heart and to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. To accept the gift that he has given us on the cross and then to follow him with everything you have, to allow him to work inside you and change yourself. If you want to, if you want to make that decision today, as we sing this song, as we sing the ending of reckless love, as we sing about how Jesus comes after us and invites us to be in a relationship with him, I want to invite you to come forward and start that relationship today. Don't base it off of anybody else. Do it for you. Let's sing.
Bless our week, and as we go out and serve you, we love you and praise your name. Amen. Would you, uh, would you just bow your heads for a moment? No music for a moment. I just feel like somebody wanted to come, but didn't. Let's just wait a moment more. That message is so appropriate. The greatest thing for Christianity is Christians. The worst thing for Christianity is Christians. You know, because we don't live out the Christian life. And that was a wonderful reminder today. We need to live out the Christian life. So if you're here this moment and you look at your life and it's just not as it should be when you're out there, would you there right now in your seat as a Christian, a follower of Christ, say, God, forgive me of that. I'm done with that. I want to practice your presence. I want to be real. I want to be bold. I want people to see Jesus in me in whatever the setting. I'm tired and done with being a chameleon. Would you make that commitment today? Would you do that? If you're here right now and you're not a believer, today is your day. The Spirit of God is calling you. And it's true, there is no lie he won't take away. There's no wall. He, he's pursuing you. God is pursuing you because he loves you. He wants you to be saved. But you have to be saved on his terms, on Jesus, on the cross, on resurrection of Christ. We sang that, we believe. What a great song, we believe. We believe Jesus loved us, died for us, arose from the dead. Would you believe that today? And right now, would, if you need to be saved, would you muster the courage and walk right up here to the front and be saved today? Would you do that? We'll wait just a moment. We're not going to embarrass you. You're not going to have to say anything. But we want you to be saved. The Spirit of God wants you to be saved. Would you come? We'll wait just a moment. If you couldn't quite gather the courage, see me after this service, all right? I'd love to talk to you, and we can try to answer any questions you may have. Our Father, we do love you. Help us to be real. Help us to practice your presence. Help us to be the same person we would be if Jesus was physically in our presence, full of love and worship of him and boldness for him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated just for a moment. Thank you, Brandon. Just a moment more. Just uh, want to introduce Tim Hood to you. Now, let me explain something before, right before he comes. Uh, we believe that the way you support our church is through tithes and offerings. Amen? Let me say that again. We believe you support our church through tithes and offerings. All right. Always support me when I say that, okay? Amen. Amen. All right. It's tithes and offerings. But people have abilities, and uh, they like to use those abilities to to provide an offering. This is not the tithe offering. Uh, Mark Brazo is going to do a, a barbecue. He has the best barbecue on the planet. All right. And uh, um, he's going to do that. And it's for our mission team. It's not for our church. We're going to Panama this summer. Ten folks are going. And uh, and we're going to do vac vacation Bible school. And but we're we're going to they're going to use their talents to try to raise some money. So we can help our missionary. He's trying to raise money for a car. We had, he wants us to bring down six or seven hundred dollars worth of gospel tracts. There's other materials and things we need to do for them, and so uh, we're going to. Mark's going to use his talent to do that. That's on April the 13th. Uh, but Tim here has a business. A friend of mine. He has a business selling jewelry uh, in Chesapeake. They sell to the Philadelphia 76ers. Is one of their. Uh, customers and so he has an idea he, they've done this for other church now we're not selling any jewelry today we don't sell stuff at church like that all right but he wants to let you know about it and so tim's going to come and then he'll dismiss us in prayer and then we'll be dismissed for bible study there's plenty of food left over if you want to go grab some and eat it during the sunday school class all right uh, and uh, if you're a guest i want to meet you as well and if you'd like to know more about the lord if you need to be saved see me as well all right tim good to see you today brother yes, how are you man good, good seeing you Oh, it's been a long time. How's everyone doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. Um, uh, mission team people, raise your hand real quick. 
Awesome, awesome. Um, if you've never gone on a mission trip, I, I know it's kind of like, I don't know if there are rooms still available or whatever. I strongly urge you before I start anything, please, 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 please go on a mission trip. It will change your heart, your, your outlook on life. It's amazing. But um, just, I'm going to try to be real quick, if possible. Um, it's Iverson Diamond Company. Uh, we do sell the 76ers. It's not as good as everybody thinks it is. I mean, basketball players, they're very particular in what they want. Um, the way this all started, we weren't even planning on doing anything like this to help churches. Um, we were helping churches, but not the way this started. Um, a friend of mine in Williamsburg asked if we would help him during Christmas. And I was like, yeah, we can help you. He's like, but I have something totally different in mind. So it was his idea. It was a pastor in Williamsburg, James City Community Church. His idea, he's like, how about we, we have a lot of managers and a lot of people in our church that have, you know, people they know. If we just, we're, we're struggling our budget a little bit. We want our vacation Bible school to try to take care of as much as possible for the budget. I was like, sure, I'll help out. What, what's your idea? And so basically he said, 50% of all profit that anyone from our church, if they buy, we're not trying to say get in debt. Please do not get in debt for jewelry. It's a, it's a, it's a want. It's a nice want, but it's a want. It's not a need. But if you do buy jewelry, um, basically he was saying if they do or anyone in their community that does it and puts their name or their church name, that we would give half the profit back to the church. I was like, let me talk over the guys. I'm pretty sure we can do that. We did. I said, sure, we'll, we'll do that. And they were, they were hoping they can get just half their budget covered. They were hoping just half. We wrote them a check for $12,000 in February. And it's just because they just went out. Hey, if you're buying jewelry, if you know someone who's going to buy jewelry, just put our church name in there because it goes to this. So for us, it's going to stand in Jackie Sherwood. And I love staying in Jackie Sherwood. When they first decided to go in the mission field, I was so happy for them, but I was so sad because I don't know if y'all remember, he was a youth uh, junior high and, and she was a junior high girls. And I was like, no, they're so good, but they have such a great heart. So that's a little bit, I have a little table back there if you just want to like pick up a pen or ask questions. Um, because you're in Richmond, I don't do this to any other church, but I live here. If you want me to come to your house, I will. Um, we do a lot of stuff online because our main store is in Philadelphia, which I don't know y'all want to drive there, or Chesapeake. But since I'm, I live here, I will bring stuff to you. I did it for Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Brazo. If you raise your right hand, if you have any questions, like how I do it, I, if you want anything, I'll come see you. Like, it's no big deal there. But that's, that's all I have. Any questions, comments, complaints? Amazing. Okay. Let's pray. Let's go, go to Sunday school and we'll go from there. Our God, how great you are to us. And Lord, I thank you so, so much for everything you've given to us. I thank you for this church. I thank you for the church leadership. And Lord, I put you, ask you to put a special blessing around Pastor and Miss Kathy. Lord, we just love you and thank you for everything you've given to us. Lord, all the missionaries and churches are going right now. Lord, I ask you just let your Holy Spirit just fill every room, sanctuary, wherever, even meeting house. And Lord, as we go to Sunday school, Lord, I ask you just to uh, prepare our hearts. Um, we love you. And I have no other desire than to serve you and want to see others come to you. Lord, I ask you just to just bless in all aspects of that. Lord, in everything we do, we all give you all honor and all glory and all praise. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Now,